I'm thrilled to be back at I.O. Uh, last year's event was a real highlight for me. Uh, so when Dave and Jer asked me back, of course I said yes, although uh, when I said yes, I had anticipated that I'd be giving a very different talk than the one that I have planned. A little backstory: I gave my first conference talk 11 years ago in Amsterdam, and while on that trip to Amsterdam, I learned some very uh, important things. The least interesting thing I learned was that before taking the stage, I should be sure to clear the clutter off my desktop. <laughs> and it wasn't that there was anything particularly embarrassing on my desktop, but there was definitely some clutter, and uh, I'd set aside a quick time that I wanted to show at the end of the talk, and it took me a little while to find it, and you know, the lights were really bright, and I felt all these eyes on me, and it was just an annoying thing to have to deal with um, on stage, especially so considering I'd spent much of the previous evening trying to convince myself that the talk would go fine, and I probably wouldn't pass out from stage fright. From that point on, before doing any presentation, I made sure that I would take all the, the miscellany that was on my desktop, and I'd put it in a folder called desktop clutter, and I would just tuck it away on the hard drive so I wouldn't have to worry about it. And any content that was left behind would be stuff that I needed for my talk. Um, however, if, um, if you uh, are anything like me and are prone to uh, fits of excessive procrastination, it won't be long before you're <laughs> Uh, before your desktop clutter folders begin recursing. <laughs> uh, so I decided that I would modify this plan a bit, and instead I would just make a few folders, and I would, I would divvy the clutter up into these few folders, but I would leave them on the desktop where there'd be a greater chance that I would deal with them in a timely manner. Uh, and for the sake of the audience, I would give these folders interesting names. <laughs> and. And then I would quit out of Keynote to run a live demo, and the audience would get a glimpse of these folders, and um, they would end up wondering, perhaps even for years to come, uh, just what it is I could have in a folder called Stupid Babies. <laughs> I also started to name some of these folders after jobs that I didn't have, or uh, perhaps even software I should not own. And it was at a... <laughs> Uh, it was at a talk that I gave in New York early last year that I left uh, Keynote windowed on purpose for the Q&A portion of the talk. And uh, the first question I was asked, I believe by Josh Noble, was what was in the CIA folder. And, and I pretended to get all nervous, and I quickly hit the desktop and moved on to the next question. <laughs> um, so Josh Noble, if you're here, now you know. It was all a ruse. I, um, at that point, I started to also name my folders after jobs I actually wish I had the, uh, realities that I wish I were a part of, and that's how I came to have a folder on my desktop called CERN 2012 Residency. <laughs> uh, four months later, CERN announced their very first artist in residency call for submissions for the year 2012, so this was fate. It was totally meant to be. So I told all my friends I was applying, and they said that it was fate and that it was meant to be. So. Here was my plan. <sighs> I, would, uh, I would apply for the residency and I would get it. I would spend my spring in Switzerland meeting some of the finest minds in the fields of particle physics and cosmology. Um, I'd be in awe of their intellect and they would be impressed with my charm. Um, And uh, I, I would learn a great deal about the current origin story of the universe, which is something that I'm very fascinated by. Um, and that would, that would inspire me to make a really immersive, interactive particle physics playground that would be so compelling that uh, it would be instantly be uh, reddited and boing boinged and cockied. And then I'd be invited to speak at TED, where I'd meet Malcolm Gladwell and Bono. And, <laughs> and they'd introduce me to Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then the four of us would go camping in Finland and, 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 and drink whiskey while looking up the aurora, but... <sighs> okay. On December 5th, uh, four days after I agreed to speak at I.O., uh, CERN announced the winner of the residency and I didn't get it. Jared Thorpe was wrong. <laughs> All, and so very wrong he was. So uh, I was uh, suddenly in a position where I needed to come up with a talk for IO that did not involve CERN and end with a lovely story about a drunken snowball fight under the stars. 
So it was time for me to make new work. So I started to think about my work. In particular, I started to think about the environments in my work and how I often am so focused on making specific things that I don't pay attention to where these things live and what surrounds them. Um, so most of my work exists as this content that floats in an in infinite black or infinite white space. So this time around, I would focus on the setting and uh, then worry about the content from there. And the setting should be something simple, something that I knew that I could do really well as opposed to like a full terrain engine, which I might be able to pull off, but uh, it would be sloppy at best. So um, because I'm fascinated by simulation, simulation of, of natural uh, events or simulation of things that occur in space, uh, I decided to uh, base my, my setting on the concept of the Cornell box. Uh, if you don't know what the Cornell box is, it is a, um, a box, and that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's a box made by some students at Cornell University who are working on the problem of how to better model the interaction of light between diffuse surfaces. So they built a box, which was just a cube with an open face, and they painted one wall red and one wall blue. And then they would photograph it under very controlled lighting conditions. And then they would compare the photograph with a render that they did, and this was 1984, so you know, the renders weren't stupendous. But um, they would notice uh, what was different about the render compared to the actual photograph, and they would figure out what they needed to change about their, uh, their algorithms for rendering in order to make the render look a little more like the real thing. So I don't know if, um, if people still build Cornell boxes, but I know that people still do Cornell box renders, and they generally look like this. These are a couple by Henrik Jensen. Uh, it'll be you know, a, a room, red wall, blue wall, with a single overhead light source and some geometric solids placed inside. Sometimes people break with tradition. This person added a green wall. Here we have uh, orange and blue shiny plastic walls. Here's a Cornell concept shower where <laughs> one wall controls the cold water, one is the hot. I'm not gonna tell you which is which. Here's a quantity of hair, a zucchini, uh, what looks like a flooded locker room scene, the tipped over metal folding chair is a nice touch. Uh, these two by Yoshihito Yagi were my favorite of the ones I found. He was visualizing DMRI data for a master's thesis and he did some of the renders in a Cornell box and I think they came out beautifully. This is um, a computer simulation used to create a simulation space for doing computer simulation simulations. Uh, and this is a nice sort of tongue in cheek render of a Cornell box that's being built. Although um, why you would start painting the walls before you put them up is beyond me. So I don't know anything about photon mapping. I don't know very much about ray tracing. So I did decide to build my own Cornell box and here it is and I would just stick random crap that I had lying around in my apartment. <laughs> you know, because everybody owns a couple thousand red dice. Uh, and I just paid attention to how it affected the lighting in the room and it was just an interesting exercise. It didn't actually prove to be as <laughs> inspiring as I hoped it would be, but like this I think is an interesting concept because I printed some 3D forms that were computer generated and then I put them in a space and photographed them as if they were renders. And here's three nested Cornell boxes. Um, and then I started playing Draw Something with Seb. And uh, Seb, if you're here, uh, the answer is bunny. So go ahead and claim your coins. Oh. <sighs> I went to art school. <laughs> so um, another really great way to learn more about uh, light transport and how light interacts with surfaces is to Photoshop giant babies into Civil War photographs. Oh, my timing is off. Damn you, Keynote. <laughs> um, I know that's not true. I Photoshop um, normal sized babies into Civil War photographs. <laughs> so this is, this is Rena at Yorktown. Uh, 1862, here we have Sylvia after the Battle of Spotsylvania. <laughs> now, this actually is a useful exercise because you need to pay attention to the lighting conditions in the photo. Is it overcast, is it sunny? Uh, is the camera low to the ground or high up? Uh, what sort of shadows are being cast in the space? And then you have to find pictures of other people's babies, stupid or not, and uh, insert them into the photo so that it looks real. This one is Lilu with uh, Alan Pinkerton at the Battle of Antietam. Um, this one didn't turn out very well because uh, little Lilu was lit under overcast sky and uh, Pinkerton was lit by a low bright sun. This is Claire at the Siege of Vicksburg. This one was also uh, 
not very successful, but I can hardly be blamed. It um, turns out, interesting fact, uh, parents don't photograph their baby from 50 feet back and two stories up. <laughs> I mean, Google is an impressive tool, but try Googling for elevated distance photos of backlit babies and <laughs> you're gonna walk away as disappointed as I. And this is, um, this is Joseph at Harewood General Hospital, I presume listening to the moanings of amputees. And as I was fine tuning the shadow that Joseph is casting, uh, making sure that it didn't obscure the wear and tear on the hardwood floor, it really started to occur to me that I've got to get this whole procrastination thing under control. <laughs> um, I mean, I really put my back into it when I procrastinate. So, <laughs> so it was time for me to start making work. And so uh, over the last couple months, I made uh, about 14 new pieces. Um, I'm not going to be able to show them all, uh, so I will start with where I started for all of them. I created, ooh, I've got this tool to make the menu bar go away. <sighs> Black. Um, so I created uh, a room. It's, it's based on the concept of the Cornell box, but uh, I, I did away with color because that's, you know, that's too much personality. Who needs that? So the room is a very simple room. It's, um, I've got a camera mounted on some weak springs so that I can look around the space. Um, and the camera will re resettle. Um, I can control gravity in the room, so I've got a toggle for turning gravity on and off. Um, I've got a main power switch. Oh, and my audio's not plugged in, actually. Where's the, uh... here we go. All right, I'm about to plug, so careful. There we go. Um, I also have control over how fast uh, time plays back in this space. So um, you see two bars over here in the corner. The top bar is how fast time is progressing. So I can speed it up or I can bring it to a complete standstill. The bottom line will be the frames per second for the app. So uh, if it's maxed out, that's 60 frames per second and that's what I'm, I'm shooting for for all these pieces. So um, I wasn't sure where to begin, but uh, because of my fascination with cosmology, I thought that I would try to do a, a, a representation of the Big Bang, because you know it, it's only trillions and trillions and trillions of particles. I figured my laptop could handle that. I was wrong. Uh, so I needed to find a way to abstract the concept of the Big Bang so that um, I could use some creative license to, uh, to create an experience that was Big Bang-ish, but um, wasn't necessarily a, a direct representation of what scientists think happened. So um, without Further delay, this is my representation of the Big Bang. <laughs> a little party for myself. So um, it's just three different particle emitters. I have balloon particles that uh, have buoyancy, so they float up. The particles and the balloons themselves are actually two particles. Uh, one is suspended from a spring below the other. So when I do collision detection for the main shape of the balloon, the spring particle will swing back and forth and create a, a reasonable illusion of the, the balloons tipping as they float. We'll do it again so you can see. Um, so if you, as I toggle between these two modes, you can see that this black balloon has got a tilt to it because of the swinging uh, secondary particle. Um, I've got um, confetti particles. Those are you know, pretty straightforward. Let's uh, swing around and show you a piece of confetti. So uh, check out that green guy over on the left. Um, so they're just uh, simple spinning cubes. I squash cubes and allow them to spin. As they fall, they drift to the side, so it, uh, the behavior's a little more organic. And then the streamers are also just particles that leave a trail as they fall. You know, if you slow down that sound effect, it sounds like their heart's not in it. It's like, uh, yeah. Okay, so enough of that. I'm wasting time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I know I'm going to run long if I spend too much time explaining these. So this is, um, this is one that I was l uh, less happy with. This is a, a representation of how matter and antimatter uh, uh, would collide and annihilate. Um, so I'm not going to give you too much backstory on it. I'm just going to go ahead and go straight for the, uh, the big bang, as it were. So every one of these black particles should be considered matter or antimatter, whichever you want, and the white particles would be the other. They're drawn, uh, matter and antimatter are drawn together because they have different charges, uh, but matter and matter will repel. So what ends up happening is white particles and black particles will meet 
annihilate. It'll be a flash of light, big bang. So uh, we'll show that right now. I wanted to also show that interaction on a macro scale, so um, and now it's just two particles. And because nobody can really say what a particle of matter or antimatter looks like, um, I figured I could use some uh, some of my own uh, creative discretion. Uh, so I can move these particles together slowly, and I have to be careful to move them slowly because they're they're a bit moody. Make sure I don't get them too close too quickly. So the antimatter will start to reach out for the matter because that is what it wants to do. And as I continue to move them closer, the reaction gets more and more violent. broke it. Um, my, first, uh, my first experience with the aesthetics of physics was probably similar to many of yours, these uh, bubble chamber or cloud chamber photographs from, um, uh, these, are, these are pretty old, I think some of these are from like 1965, yeah this one's dated 65, so this is a pretty outdated method for seeing what happens when particles collide. Uh, the, the things that are going on at CERN now produce uh, three-dimensional data so you can you know you can see all around the uh, collision whereas these earlier methods relied purely on photographic e photographic evidence so I wanted to do my homage to bubble chambers and um, go ahead and launch that so uh, this this room allows in small quantities of particles if they happen to collide with any other particle or maybe even a, a tiny piece of dust then they will shatter and into component particles, which will go spiraling off into space. It's a pretty rare event, so let me turn it up a bit. Might have to wait for a second. Because, waiting. That's, that's nothing when you're on stage. Kill a couple minutes this way. So this is taking far longer than I wanted. I'm going to do something I probably shouldn't. Um, so I figured out that if I, if I release moths into this space, uh, it facilitates the, the collision events, so we're going to go ahead and turn the power down. Oh, it's a, it's a bit dark. I'll turn it back up. Uh, and now I'm going to release a bunch of moths. So we can get a 3D view of what's going on in this space. Those poor moths gave their life for my talk. I'm going to break it. I'm going to keep adding moths until it yells at me. It always makes me laugh. I'm new to sound design, can you tell? Oh, it, okay, so I broke it. Um, this one uh, did not turn out very well, so I'm not going to show you the live version. I'll just show you the render. It's based on a piece that I did a couple years ago called Addition Subtraction, and it was just a, an alternate way to visualize uh, competing forces. So if you have the black representing negative and the white representing positive, um, you can see how particles emitted by those charged forces will uh, end up uh, moving along the flow field lines in the space. Uh, I want to do more with this one, but I was running into issues with um, uh, how to optimize it so that I can get away with more particles. This is not real time. Real time would be more like eight to 10. Uh, so I decided to, uh, to not show the, the live version of that one. Um, this next one is a little depressing and I apologize in advance, but the subject matter is depressing. It's based on the concept of the uh, ant death spiral, which is a pretty depressing name in and of itself. Hopefully you've heard of or seen this. Uh, ants get around by leaving chemical trails and they sense for chemical trails so they can know if they're going towards food or if they're heading home. Um, and uh, once an ant finds some food, it'll leave a stronger trail on the way back to the nest. So any other ants that stumble upon that trail know which way to go for food. Eventually it turns into this super highway of just ants scavenging back and forth. Um, sometimes if there's like a storm or a flash flood, the trail gets cut off and the ants don't know what to do. 
when they get confused, so they start following the ant in front of them. And if you have a bunch of ants following the ant in front of them, if the lead ant circles around and meets back with the original trail, it creates this loop. And sometimes the loop can be you know, half a mile in diameter of just ants constantly moving, thinking they're getting somewhere. Eventually, they all die. They all die from exhaustion. It's, it's a horrible thing. I found this video online. I'm going to play this real quick. In the arms Um, so <laughs> that's not even the project. <laughs> so I'm gonna show some iterations that I did, um, and I'm gonna go through these real quick. So this was the first uh, step. Instead of actually dealing with pheromone trails, which I knew I'd get to later, um, I decided to use zones. So the illustration on the back wall shows um, the zone in front of the ant where if any other ant crosses into that zone, then um, the original ant will follow it. The movement didn't end up being all that organic, so um, uh, well, first, I, uh, I tried different size zones to see if that made much difference. I started to put markers over these ants so I could better follow the specific movements of, of a particular ant. Here, the zone actually extends all the way back around the ant. And the, the movement's interesting, but it's not what I wanted because it, it didn't feel insect like enough. I mean, their spacing is too, uh, is too rigid. So, um, this is where I first started to pay attention to ants leaving a trail behind them. Um, and in this case, they're just leaving the trail. They're not picking it up, so it's a, it was a one-way interaction. And then um, uh, here, again, disregard the illustration on the wall. By this point, I had switched to looking at the pheromone trails. Um, but uh, the ants weren't doing what I wanted them to. I wanted them to form these death spirals and eventually die, which <laughs> probably doesn't speak too highly of my character, but ants are hard workers. I figured they could handle it, so instead of um, suspending the markers above them, I decided that, that maybe the ants should carry them themselves. <laughs> and that tiny change really made this uh, more personal. I started to feel for these guys. So they, they, they began to behave better. There's an invisible pile of food here, and uh, when an ant uh, grabs a piece of food, it'll turn around and head back towards the nest, all the while leaving a pheromone trail, which will appear at the end of this video. Um, but they still were doing stupid things, like they would get near the food and then they would just go completely around it, and it was really frustrating, so uh, I took out my frustrations on them when I show you the live version. So that's the pheromone trails they're leaving. They leave a red trail. Um, when they find food, they start to leave a green trail, and uh, each ant has a sensor on the front that's looking for changes in the gradation of red and green, and that tells it which way it should steer. Um, so the, the live version of that looks like this. So I've got a pile of food there. They spread out, they mo they're moving randomly, but as soon as they find a piece of food, they instantly flip and go back in the other direction. So uh, you can see the pheromone trails that they're leaving behind. But because I never managed to get them to form the ant death spiral, even once their food ran out, I decided to just drop a piece of anti-food in there to see what would happen. So it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little white dot uh, that's being carried. Um, hopefully, I mean, it's probably not smart to rely on randomness when you're on stage, but hopefully he'll make his way. Oh yeah, there he goes. Do, do, do. Oh, that's so sad. You know, the fact that you're laughing. Um, I do, uh, I got really interested in shockwaves while working on uh, this set of projects, so I did one project that was just a quick sketch about how shockwaves could be easily coded, so um, I'm just gonna just show this one real quick. It's, uh, it's not that fleshed out, uh, there's not much to it. Um, how do I reset, there we go. So the shock wave is just a point in space, an expanding radius and a diminishing intensity. So as the shock wave expands, I check to see if any one of these particles is near the edge. If so, they get pushed away from the center of the shock wave and the amount that they're pushed is based on the intensity of the shock wave at that point. And it's nice because you can, you know, it's, it's like a 3D ripple effect and it, um, it's something that I ended up using for most of the pieces that I made this time around. 
Boom, 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 flocking. I'm not going to spend too much time with this one because hopefully you've seen some of the flocking work I've been doing over the last couple years. This is a refined version because I finally got around to trying to do all the flocking on the GPU, which was something that I hadn't considered doing until I was talking with Andrew Bell. Um, I should probably mention uh, all of these projects are made with Cinder. It's a C++ framework that I've been working on with Andrew Bell. Uh, and um, we were having a conversation on the subway from Manhattan to Brooklyn, and he explained to me the general concept on how to get GPU particles to change their orientation in space. And that was all I needed to come up with a decent GPU-based flocking simulation. So when you turn the lights out, the predators get really aggressive. And uh, you know, glowing balls of light fall from the ceiling, as they are wont to do. Um, and then when you turn the time up, or the speed up, it, uh, the, uh, the fish form these really nice vortices as they get drawn to the, the glowing light, whereas the predators are repulsed by the glowing light. Uh, and it creates this nice dynamic. I should have put some audio on this one. Some more Sarah McLaughlin would have been great. Um, just as a quick aside, because uh, all the math was being done on the GPU, uh, you need to store their positions and velocities in a texture. So I thought this was a really nice view of what was actually going on in that simulation. Each one of these pixels doesn't actually represent a color. It represents a point in three-dimensional space. The RGB gets switched out with XYZ. So the top row is uh, two squares. Just focus on one of them. That's positions. That represents the position of all the objects in the simulation. The bottom two rows represent the velocity. So you just add two textures together, and you can get some nice particle movement on the GPU. Uh, this one was uh, really disappointing for me, because after the success of pushing flocking to the GPU, I wanted to push uh, uh, sphere sphere collisions to the GPU, uh, which was a little more complicated, because you need to use like multiple target FBOs. And these were things that I had only just started to learn about. So um, you know, it started promisingly. These spheres don't look like they're intersecting, but um, after, a, after a certain amount of time, this bug appeared. And the bug was so interesting to me that I just abandoned the project because uh, I probably uh, wouldn't be able to make this on my own. Um, they started to do these really odd, like, globby dances. And I don't understand what is wrong with my code to make that happen. <laughs> but. Uh, it makes them feel alive, so I like to think that I just managed to create life and, <laughs> and I moved on. I did a render of that piece uh, so you can see what it looks like with uh, 28,000 particles. And it is surreal, and I have no idea what I did. <laughs> so I'm scared to touch the code because I don't, I don't want to lose this, but then again, I wouldn't even know how to capitalize on this. This is just this random surreal behavior that uh, really took me by surprise. Terrain. I also do a lot of work with uh, terrain simulations. Uh, a couple years ago, I started messing around with reaction diffusion equations, and uh, I haven't gotten as deep into it as like nervous system and McCabe, but uh, it's still a, a fascinating concept to me that two lines of code can create these really intricate, natural-looking patterns. Um, I at one point started to add wind as a as a parameter for the reaction diffusion equation, and the result ended up looking enough like migrating sand dunes that I thought uh, maybe I should try to do a three-dimensional version of it. So I have this sphere in this room, and the position of the sphere will determine which way the wind is blowing. So as I turn the wind speed up, these, these dune-like formations start to form. Let me get a side view of it so you can see it a little better. Um, so uh, it's just a simple reaction diffusion equation, uh, but I've just decided to push the reaction diffusion um, in a specific direction, and it just automatically started to form these really nice looking dune-like patterns. I haven't figured out the best way to capitalize on it, but I'd like to do a, like a full terrain simulation that allows you to you know, like surf along these dunes in an interesting way. camera on the surface, but I'm trying to remember what the key commands are for that one. I think that's it. So let's see. Yeah, 
circumstance pretty disorienting, but um, you know, it's a start. I'm gonna continue to expand on this sketch as, uh, over the coming months. Um, as you saw with the flocking simulation, I, I, um, I like, can I say this? I like glowing balls. <laughs> and uh, the work that I did with uh, Bloom on the planetary app is pretty indicative of that. I love trying to find ways to create uh, the illusion of a, a really immense star that's just full of energy. And uh, so this is a, a really quick tutorial for how to do something like that. If you wanted to, you could start with just a circle. Um, and there's your star, the end. But I, um, I started to use these, these textured gradients. I don't know how well that's showing up, but um, you have the circular form and then there's a fall off. So when you toggle to night viewing, you, it feels like it has a strong glow to it. Um, I started to add this thing that I've been calling the, the coronal ring. It's, a, it's just an extra graphic that you can place on top and it just covers the perimeter of the, the actual star form. So when you toggle that light off and then uh, turn the texture gradient back on. It's starting to feel a little more rich. It seems to have a little more uh, energy to it. The next step, which is generally the most um, computationally heavy, is to add a sphere. Now you can, you can ignore the sphere if you want, um, but if you wanna do any effects on the surface of the sphere, um, having a sphere is a really nice thing because it, the normal's already built in and so it's a pretty easy thing to add some, some special effects to. And it just, just knowing there's a sphere there makes it feel more weighty and powerful. So then you turn on the coronal ring and then the textured gradient and it's starting to look, it's starting to look a lot better. So now we switch to adding some, um, some particles to it. So uh, I'm just putting particles on the surface of the sphere. In this case, the particle will move away from the center while getting slightly larger. The other particle emitter starts on the surface of the sphere moves away from the center, but rotates as it does so. So this particular particle emitter will be, um, will use a graphic that is hard to see. It's like a, a crescent glow. The other particle emitter will use something more like a, a, a smoke sprite. So you combine the glow and the smoke and the sphere and the coronal ring and the texture, and you've got a fairly nice looking star form. Uh, there's one extra step you can add, which I've been ignoring lately, but it's up to you. Um, I've been calling this dust. It's uh, just a bunch of GL points, I think maybe 10,000. They start on the surface of the sphere, they move out. It's just an extra change in scale to add a little more dimension, but you'll see that once I turn on the sphere and the coronal ring and the texture gradient and the glows and the nebula, the, the dust pretty much goes away, so it's, it's totally optional. Um, <laughs> add salt to taste. So this is, uh, this is our sun. Um, the planets are randomly colored, so don't go looking for Earth. Um, interesting fact, the sun is white. Uh, it just looks yellow because of how the atmosphere bends the light rays. And here we have um, Sirius, uh, the, the brightest star in our sky by a factor of two. Here's uh, Vega, now these are all to scale. Uh, Vega is where Jodie Foster and her dad hung out on that beach that one time. <laughs> Here's Gliese 581, um, best uh, potential candidate for Earth-like life is on one of the planets revolving around that. Uh, here's HD 10180, which might have as many as nine planets, which would make it the, the exoplanet with the most uh, discovered, uh, sorry, the star with the most discovered exoplanets. Gliese 710 is hurtling towards our galaxy and might uh, destroy us all, but I think not for another 140,000 years. Alpha Centauri A, and one of its companion stars, Proxima Centauri. And the largest star that's been found um, in our uh, universe is very big, uh, Canis Majoris. Um, how am I on time? I've got 13 minutes. I'm gonna skip Galaxy. Galaxy was another failed one. I wanted to try to get spiral arms to naturally form and I just wasn't able to get there yet. It was also pushed to the GPU. So I think I have a pretty fundamental pushing stuff to a GPU bug that, um, that won't break the code, it just won't make it look pretty enough. Uh, and here we have catalog. Oh, I should show you the illustration. So uh, when I was growing up, I was definitely an astronomy fan and I had these star charts and I love the, the harsh aesthetic of these charts, especially that they chose to print black dots on white, which I'm sure they did for 
uh, cost reasons and legibility, but um, there was just something interesting about that. But I was just, I was more interested in the fact that there would be all these dots that just had no name, and uh, they represented these really great points of mystery, because I want to know what's out there, what is around that star, how big is that star, does it have planets, is there life? Um, I didn't, uh, I lived uh, close enough to the city that my father refused to buy me a telescope because the light pollution would be bad enough that uh, I wouldn't get his money's worth. So I, <laughs> I gave up on the dream to own a Mead 12 inch reflecting telescope. <sighs> So I've got to stick with um, simulation. So I downloaded a database of 116,000 of the closest um, and brightest stars to our sun and plotted them in space. Um, and let's just go ahead and move into the center. How's that showing up? Oh, good. So there's our sun, little black dot. And uh, we can choose to look up at Sirius, which I showed you earlier, uh, brightest star in the night sky by a factor of two. So we can toggle to the night view. Um, and when we can zoom in on Sirius and find out more about what's going on, what color is it, uh, what names did it have throughout history. I should point out this is faked data. I'm not pulling from any live database because I haven't found any good ones yet. I couldn't even find a database that would give me uh, information about constellations so I can connect stars to form the lines because I wanted to see what like Orion looked like if you viewed it from another angle. But I haven't found any good databases that I can incorporate into these 116,000 stars, unfortunately. And then we can look down at, I think that's Vega again. Look for Jody. And here, uh, this tiny red dot is Gliese 581. Again, the, uh, the star that has uh, exoplanets that have the best chance of, of possibly, being, possibly being able to support Earth-like life. But um, the thing that I'm fascinated by is we can now we can go to Gliese and look back at our own sun, and we can wonder, you know, would, would life on Gliese 581G um, include our sun in their constellations? Would they, uh, you know, would we be featured in one of their crazy shapes or creatures? And it turns out probably not, because Gliese from Earth and our sun from Gliese is uh, dim enough, far enough away that uh, you can't see it with, um, without using telescopes. So we would be one of those unnamed stars in their star chart that maybe some Gleason is looking up at. Uh, perhaps their father bought them a telescope. <laughs> um, I'm not bitter, it's, I mean, <laughs> but it, it felt like some, some wasted youth. I would even leave like the Sears catalog open to the telescope page on the sofa, thinking that you know, he'd come home and suddenly get it, but that didn't work. Um, but I also like that with simulation, you can put yourself down on the surface of the planet that is revolving around Gliese. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is purely based on my imagination. Uh, Gliese is a red star, so this planet would actually be bathed in red light and all content would probably look black. So I've used some creative liberties to make it this really nice field with earth plants for some reason. And it's seismically active and there's a nice green glow from what I don't know. I hope it's not toxic. Um, now, I, <laughs> it's not funny. I really wanted that telescope. I wasn't going to show this piece, but um, I was talking to uh, Aaron Coblin and Andrew Bell, and um, based on that conversation, I decided I would show it. It is also a work in progress, and it was the piece that I actually started on first after the uh, CERN rejection. I, I decided that I wanted to go ahead and try to make the things that I was envisioning for, uh, for that CERN residency. I wanted to make, so CERN has this uh, facility that's a uh, half sphere, and um, and I thought it'd be great to put uh, these multi-touch displays in a circle inside of this space, and you would be able to just like uh, touch and create particles that you could just whiz around the space, and they would keep going until they collide, and then there'd be this nice collision event. My problem with CERN, and maybe this is why I didn't get the residencies, because I think I started my, my, my video recording of explaining why I wanted it by saying, the problem with CERN is that um, the stuff that comes out of there is kind of ugly. With astronomy, you can look up at you know, you can look at any image that came out of Hubble and be in awe of these beautiful spiral galaxies. And it just makes you want to experience that on a more personal level. But then CERN will do a press release where they show 
a graph with a spike in it, and that's what billions of dollars paid for. And it's hard to get children interested in subatomic physics when it's just books of formula and graphs. So I thought that if I had gotten the residency, I'd try to find a way to make these particle interactions a little more aesthetically pleasing, a little more personal, um, and, and just overall more engaging and not just a, a bump on a graph. So um, I started pretty simply by, oh, I should probably just quick launch that. Um, I started on the iPad because I wanted, uh, I wanted to deal with touches first and uh, doing touch interaction is not my forte. I usually get other people to do that hard work for me. Um, and so the thinking was you would touch, the longer you held your finger there, the more massive the particle would get. There would be sphere-sphere collision, um, and you could, uh, if you got two spheres to collide fast enough, it would shatter into smaller spheres. You could spin the spheres, so you could uh, give them a rotation that would affect the spheres around them. And so this was, this was all running on the iPad. I, after I got far enough along, I switched over to creating a desktop version because um, developing for iPad can be a little time consuming uh, with the compile times. So, I mean, you kind of get the idea. You create this space that has these spheres in it, and um, if there's any strong enough collision, it'll shatter, and it becomes this interactive thing where you can start to participate in this act of particle collision. Uh, six minutes, that'll work. So, um, this is definitely a work in progress. I did a render, because I didn't want to run the, the real version. Uh, I mean, you want to build up tension, and so if I tried to show the, uh, the live version, it would probably take a good 10 minutes to really get it going. Um, the thinking is that uh, you would be injecting mass into this space, and, um, and the, there would be a conservation of mass. So um, any particles that were touching, the larger particle, what, that's not a flattering photograph. What is this? <laughs> 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 Damn, you waited. Um, the larger particle would, uh, would pull mass from the smaller particle once they interacted. So over time, the smart smaller particle would get smaller and smaller, and then you'd have the one larger particle. But the more mass you injected into the simulation, the greater the chance that this particle get larger and larger. And at some point, it transitions into a star. It just ignites. It turns into a light source and pulls in even more content. Eventually, once the star gets large enough, it will shatter. Um, and there will be a conservation of mass where the mass of that star gets turned back into you know, a thousand smaller particles so that once you add up all those particles, it's the same as the original star. Um, so this is how far I've gotten. And uh, it's, um, it's a piece that I'm going to uh, pick up uh, as soon as I get back uh, to town. Um, the reason that I even went through this whole process of making new work is because the code that I'd written for Collider had really gotten away from me. I was putting in so many details without really stabilizing the foundation that it's gotten to a point where when I look at the code, I have no idea what I've done. It just looks, um, it just looks uh, confusing to me. So I um, should probably clear this clutter. We learned an important lesson. I mean, I know where that quick time is, but just in case. How's everybody? Um, all right, so here is uh, where I am with Collider. I see. Can we turn the lights down for this one?
so somber, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you actually lucked out. My, my original ending was uh, to explain how the universe was going to end and then remind you all that you're gonna be dead in 100 years, so you won't have to worry about it. So, um, <laughs> which I, I guess I just told you anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, so that's all I have, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I should mention uh, the source code for all the projects, except for the last one, which I just need to gut and redo. Uh, I'm going to post once I get back to San Francisco so you can play along. Uh, the source is not very pretty, um, but I plan on uh, pulling out all the things that I sort of shoehorned in for this presentation to make them uh, more discrete chunks of manageable code. Uh, so uh, keep an eye on at Flight 404, and I'll let everybody know when that's posted. Thank you. Thank you.